This is Hashtag Finance, presented to you by the Canadian Securities Exchange, the exchange for entrepreneurs, with your host, Anil Mall. Welcome to all our viewers and listeners. I'm Anil Mall with the Canadian Securities Exchange, and uh, thank you for joining us for another edition of Hashtag Finance. This is the Canadian Security Exchange's podcast. And today I have the pleasure to be joined by not one, but two gentlemen. Uh, I've got Paul Woodward. Paul is the president and director of Aether Catalyst Solutions, Inc., which is listed on the CSE. And uh, along with Paul is joining us, uh, sorry, along with Paul joining us will be Greg James. Uh, Greg is the chief operations officer with the company. And gentlemen, thank you very much for taking the time to virtually join the Canadian Securities Exchange today. No, thanks for having us. Yeah, we're no pleased problem. to be here. Great. How, how are, I'm going to start off a little bit, you know, we've all been working from home where we're, I'm going into three months here uh, since March the 10th. So how, how are you gents? How, how are you, how you guys been coping from this whole pandemic situation, working from home? Are you guys working from home? Well, I, I am, but uh, Greg and the team are not. So I'll let Greg handle that one. Yeah. You know, one of the things is, is that uh, with, with any of our development, it's, it's very, uh, right. There's a lot of empirical development that needs to be done, and so our lab is really, really important for our for our industry. And so what we did is we we definitely took the guidelines in very early on to set up a good, safe environment here. You know, good washing standards, good social distancing. Uh, so we've actually had most of the, most of our technical staff uh, in in the office uh, for the whole time. There was a few stretches where we did have to do some some work from home. Um, but that worked out all right, you know, because, you know, with the new, new apps. So like it's Zoom. the new norm and you guys have adjusted to it. Oh. Before we get into all of this stuff, um, why don't I give you to the floor? I'm assuming it's going to be Paul here. Why don't you give our listeners and viewers um, a little bit of information on Aether Catalyst? What do you guys do? Um, well, I mean, I think, I think Greg's probably better qualified to give you that answer as well. I mean, we're, we're developing a base metal catalyst for use in automotive catalytic converters. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's something that, that I've been involved with for about 10 years. Um, we've, we've, uh, we've had failed technology before. And uh, that's one of the reasons we brought Greg in is he's got, you know, tremendous expertise in developing these kinds of things. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, I think I'll let Greg discuss, you know, what specifically we're doing right now. Yeah, please, Greg. Yes. So one of the things with uh, catalytic converters is, you know, every engine, as Paul says, needs them. And, and basically the whole thing about a catalytic converter is you, you take in uh, exhaust and the, those exhausts are fairly toxic. They have carbon monoxide, nitrous oxide, and uh, unburned hydrocarbons, which we all know is smog and who wants to have smog and all that stuff. So catalytic converters were brought in to basically get all that, uh, to clean all that up into more benign species. So when we were looking at this problem, you know, I think the genesis was is that, you know, anytime you go to an OEM with a new idea, you got to have a significant cost reduction. So for us, we decided that significant cost reduction could be done through the base metal technology, like Paul was saying. That actually turns the problem into where the incumbent technology is sitting at thousands of dollars per ounce, where our technology is going to be tens of dollars per pound. So it's easy to see where we're going to get, you know, upwards of a 90% cost reduction through, through this technology. So that's where we're, where we started from. And then as of course, with any of those things, there's always going to be the problems because if, if it was already done or if it was easy, people would have already had it in the market. So that's one of the things that we've been doing has been consistently looking at the problems uh, and then overcoming those and moving forward. Uh, we're still in the, the research stage. We're getting later in the research stage, uh, but that's where our focus is, is, is getting this material that last bit to where we can actually go to an OEM and actually demonstrate in their testing, you know, that we, we've kind of met the requirements of, of the, of the you, you mentioned an acronym there, Greg. I didn't mean to cut you off. O o OEM? Yeah, original equipment manufacturer. Got it. Just for the viewers that might not understand, uh, myself included. So I just wanted to, to 
better understand what you're putting out there. Yeah, and and when we say OEMs, you know, that's that's companies like Ford, that's companies like GM, Volkswagen, Honda, Toyota. Those are the those are the big guys, and, and you know, frankly, those are the guys that we we are out talking to. You know, that's that's who the ultimate customer is for this technology. So you guys, well, Paul yourself, have been researching, working on this sort of technology for I think you said ten years. Well, we haven't been researching. We've been, um, uh, I guess, the, the majority shareholder, the controlling shareholder of Acre is a company called Conation Capital Corp. Okay. President of Conation as well. And we made an investment in this space about 10 years ago. Um, and we funded it significantly and reached the point where we couldn't, we didn't believe that the people there were able to take the technology. The technology was licensed and we didn't believe that it was going to be able to make it. Wasn't going to get, wasn't going to get there. And that's kind of when we brought Greg. We brought Greg in at that time to to give us a, I guess a, uh, a you know, a rundown on where we were and where we'd have to go. And Greg's advice was pretty much to uh, go in a different direction. So we moved in 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 a different direction with Greg leading the research. And so to say that I've been researching, I've been financing it for ten years. Interesting. <laughs> okay. Okay. I have been researching. I mean, it's it's a. I mean, it's a seductive concept, right? I mean, yeah. it, it, the dollars involved are significant. And it's, it's not easy, but, uh, you know, under Greg's leadership, I mean, they've, they've overcome a lot of technology hurdles that, you know, our prior group, group weren't able to. Yeah. Greg, why don't, why don't I let you have the floor for a bit? Why don't you tell us about, you know, when you joined the company, obviously, you've, you've got some extensive experience when it comes to this space. I think uh, your bio said you had 20 years or something like that at Ballad Power. Yeah, for sure. You know, and I've been in the in the in the high tech space. I also worked on a graphite project after Ballard. So, yeah, it was really good when I came in because again, it allowed me to see where the where the gaps are and, and ask really the right questions, and also put that sense of urgency that you know we have to go fast. Uh, we have to go very stepwise, very controlled, but but we got to go fast and we got to change some stuff. So, so yeah, it's it's been pretty exciting because in in that four and a half, five years I've been with the company now, we're on our fourth generation technology. And each one of those generations is for us a big step forward in advancing the technology. So we went from, you know, starting out just trying to prove that we could get under ideal conditions that this material could convert those toxic gases at a really high rate uh, at beginning of life, which we will call green. And, uh, and showing that we can get those high conversion rates. But then we, the real big problem started kicking in, which is aging, uh, because typically you drive your car, you know, five, 10 years is what that catalytic converter service life is. So if you have to wait five to 10 years to see if your callus is good or not, it, it just won't work. So you have to in introduce accelerated aging and that accelerated aging always is gonna, gonna encompass really high temperature. And so we had to get our cows being able to run at these really high temperatures and to be stable at these high temperatures. So that was our next big goal. And uh, that was kind of one of the, the bigger, you know, known problems with, with the base metal cows is the high temperatures. Uh, so we did solve that, you know, we went from our gen two. And then uh, the next thing is, is then of course, all internal combustion engines, when they make, when they have the little explosion, they create water as a byproduct. And water actually is, you know, it's nice to drink, but it actually turns out to be really harsh when it comes to aging materials. So that was a pretty big problem. And that one was definitely one of the ones that was a big, big issue inside uh, base metal cows for the industry. And it's even a bit of a problem for the PGMs as well. Yeah. So that was the thing where we worked really hard and between our Gen 3 and Gen 4, we were actually able to, to actually overcome that problem. And now we're seeing pretty good, pretty high conversion rates at the at the end of a accelerated aging cycle with these really high temperatures. You know, when I say high, we're talking glowing red 900 C type temperatures with the full 10% water. Uh, and then the other thing that goes on with, with, a, with a catalytic converter as well is it's not static in a car. So you can't just set it up like in a lab like we can but we actually have to talk about the dynamics. So we've done a really good job of, of pulling and incorporating a lot of the, the same uh, philosophy of evaluation as that the, the, the OEM guys do and that's done in, in the industry so that we can now start replicating when you run your, your engine, you know, a little lean or a little rich. And, and so that's, 
allowed us to, to basically have a lot of confidence when we start showing our results and, and talking to the OEMs to say exactly where we're at. So, so would it be fair to say it's a real time um, research that you guys are doing with, with your equipment? Yeah, and I would say when it comes to real time, um, it's not that we don't use engine stands. Um, here we use simulated gases, so we'll buy bottle gases and mix them together with mass flow controllers. Okay. But one of the things that we do do is, is you know, we there's two really big tests in the industry. One's called a light off test where you start at a certain air to fuel ratio and you just start up and you see what your conversion is as a function of temperature. That's really important because it tells you of when you're starting up how much bad gas is going to get out and when you start converting the bad gas to good gas. Uh, the other thing is that they call it uh, air to fuel sweep where you go from, you know, uh, you know, excess fuel to, you know, less than, than stoic for fuel. Uh, when you take those two results together, they pretty well give you the whole picture. Then you know, and that's really the phase we're at. And that's really the phase that, that we're, we're getting evaluated on. Once we get through this phase and we can show that we have very good conversion that's, that's going to be acceptable in the, in the vehicle under these tests, they are more or less the screening tests that the OEMs use. Then we'll get into the, the more dynamic test where they'll do very specific drive cycles with our material in there and they'll collect the amount of grams of, of exhaust gas that comes out over that, that you know, standard cycle that's, that's mandated by the, the department of, of uh, you know, the energy. So. Got it. Got it. So there's, there's definitely specifications and, and guidelines that you guys have to follow to meet those requirements. Correct. Yeah. And that's one of the things I would say with us as, is over the last, you know, especially two years now is that we have advanced our technology enough now that it's actually important that we actually we have to test like this because our, our material is good enough that under ideal conditions we, we we're, we're good now it's like we really need to start to get closer and closer to actually how it's going to operate in, in service so so you guys have developed this technology it's a low cost uh high performance catalyst ca catalytic converter i should say yeah um you mentioned that the cost of these goes up because of the base metals and you guys have found a way to not have those base metals in there? Uh, they actually the opposite. Okay. So, so the industry uses precious metals. So those are precious, precious metals, metals are okay. platinum, palladium, rhodium. You know, for example, you take a look at rhodium and in, in the February, I think it was over $10,000 an ounce. Palladium was up around $2,800 an ounce. Um, so with our base metal materials, so that's a, you know, a part of the periodic table. Uh, that you get the $10 per pound kind of materials. So that's where a lot of our cost savings are gonna come from. Got it. I just had it a bit backwards there yeah. for a second. Thank yeah. you for correcting me. So you guys are working on this and you've been approaching a lot of the, the top tier you know, manufacturers like Ford and, and some of the other names that you mentioned. Um, what were some of the, like what's the feedback been and are you guys still coming across, you know, sort of naysayers who are still sort of on the fence. Yeah, I think so. So when we, when we go to the OEMs, you know, there, there's always an interest for, for, for the technology because the cost reduction is such a big thing, you know, just to kind of put it in perspective, car guys are looking to try to get a dollar out of a fender, or maybe even 25 cents out of a fender because that helps the bottom line. And we're talking about something that could take hundreds of dollars out of their system. So uh, there's definitely always some interest. And then when, when we do talk to them and we start showing our stuff, um, especially now we can put the data in, in their terms. So they're, they're looking at the data and they're, they've been really helpful. They've been giving us some very good feedback on saying, you know, this, you know, this is how you should interpret the results. It could go under floor, close couples, so things like that. And they've also been very good at giving us some guidance on how we need to improve our testing. So the feedback and dialogue has been very good with them. Okay. Uh, they have also pointed out, you know, that there's definitely, uh, they would like to see a little bit more uh, performance after their, after our aging. So that's been a comment. They'd like us to do a bit, like they'd like us to improve are what I call dynamics. And that's basically being able to handle, you know, going from lean to rich and rich to lean. So they, they've given us some feedback on, you know, we have to improve that dynamics of our catalyst uh, to be able to, to really be able to map out and match what they need in the industry. Uh, well, Greg, 
right? Maybe we could give a little bit of a simplified chemistry lesson, you know, so that people understand the complexity of what a catalyst has to do. Yeah, so, so one of the things is inside a catalyst, inside a uh, catalytic converter, is actually it's a really tough problem in that you have to be able to reduce certain chemicals and oxidize other chemicals at the same time. So, you know, the mechanism for NOx to be reduced is going to be, it's, it's preferential when you're in uh, a fuel rich kind of situation, but you want to be in a fuel lean position to help uh, convert ox, uh, the CO and the hyd unburnt hydrocarbon. So there's a lot of very complicated chemistry that goes in and around that lean and rich kind of side of the equation. Um, so what we've been able to do is, you know, we've been able to close that gap and, and, and make, a, make that ability to run in there a lot better. Uh, the thing that we're getting from the feedback from the OEMs is that they would like us to improve that a little bit further. Got it. And that, that'll obviously take a little bit more research and, and, and working on these tech, uh, on the tech, I should say. Um, you guys have a facility in Burnaby, is that correct? In British Columbia? Yeah, we, uh, we actually just moved into this facility uh, in uh, December of 2018. Um, so we more or less effectively, you know, tripled our lab space and, you know, tripled our <laughs> office space. Uh, so that was really good. And it was nice because when we moved in, it was, a, it was, uh, there was nothing inside the lab. So we were able to actually put in exactly what we wanted. So we have this the lab set up. So, and I'm a big, I'm a big uh, process flow guy. So it seems to like, it's like in your kitchen, when you're working in your kitchen, if uh, you and your spouse or you and your kids don't have the same kind of flow, it gets really chaotic. So that's one thing that was really good is I could really split out the flows and, and, and allow, you know, multiple people, you know, working at stations to, to get things. And that's actually been really good because we went and, you know, our turnover on being able to test variants of catalysts has really exponentially increased. And in our industry, you know, there's still a big need for empirical testing. So throughput is, is, is in some ways king. And, and, you know, we've been able to really uh, kick up or, or through. I, I really like that analogy that you used about the kitchen and the spouse, because I think we can all relate to that one, <laughs> <laughs> whether it's kids or spouses, right? Yeah. So um, do you want to, or are you able to talk about, you know, some of the hurdles and drawbacks that you guys face when you're sort of working on this technology? Like uh, I, I imagine, you know, there's different views and opinions from, from the different, um, people that are within this space. So do you, do, did you guys, or do you still face a lot of that? Well, I think Greg touched on that. I mean, if I can go here, I think he of course, on. yeah. this is, this is a technology that has tremendous pull from the OEMs. This is something they want, right? I mean, it, it's not, yeah. we're, we're never going to have a marketing department. You know, it's just, we're not going to have to, it's going to be, and we have a, a very defined performance criteria. I mean, if we can hit that ourselves, then it's binary. We're there, right? Absolutely. I mean, there's not, there would be no reason if we could perform as well under those conditions, there'd be no reason for people to use precious metal, precious metals in catalytic converters. So and, and I mean, things make it easy for us. You know, we, we know what we, we know what we have to do. What we don't know is how close to that is still good enough. Right. I mean, and that's one of the things that, you know, is, is pure iteration. We're just iterating, 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 controlled iteration, trying to, to, solve the issues and now we're down to a single what we think i mean our primary issue is this dynamics problem greg said got but it we're not getting we get we get you know we get pull from the oems um we don't i mean we're we're not coming up with something new i mean the 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 perhaps the technology is is new but it's doing the same job as other catalysts um it's 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 fairly easy to understand it's a large market the numbers are easy to find as well. Um, so you can value what success would mean. So it's, I mean, it, it, it is pretty simple. It's just whether, you know, I mean, at the, the crux of it all is, are we going to be able to overcome issues that come up in front of us? And so far, Greg and his team have done a tremendous job of that. Yeah. And, and like you said, the cost savings are there. So it's tough to look away and, and kind of be against something like this. Um, that's, you know, definitely providing benefits, not only to the environment, but also to the pockets. Well, you know, I mean, with respect to palladium, 
125% of palladium produced in 2019. The demand for automotive catalysts represented 125% wow. of the palladium production. So, I mean, the difference was made up with the uh, recycling and drawdown of investment stocks. So that's Inga. Interesting. Um, Paul, I want to ask you, what's uh, sort of the, the, your shareholder sentiment been like throughout your journey? Well, I mean, it's, it's a little bit, you know, I mean, it's Conation has shareholders who were attracted, who invested in Conation for this opportunity. With respect to Aether shareholders, I mean, up, to, up to until about two months ago, I could probably name every single one. So there's a lot of people that we know. There's a lot of friends and family. There's a, you know, and I mean, we have is, they're excited. I mean, they're, they, you know, I mean, they, they invested in this to, you know, to have a big win, right? I mean, and, and so far, I mean, and that's the way, you know, most people look at things, right? You look at something as, if you've made an investment in a company, is the blue sky, you know, you're attracted by blue sky. If it's a speculative investment, there's got to be sufficient blue sky to pay you for your risk. Yeah. You know, and then there's also, you look at the probability side of things. Are the people capable? Are they, you know, are they doing what they're supposed to do? Is their story still the same? Are they executing on it? And, you know, if you've got those two things, you're a happy shareholder. Yeah. Paul, I know obviously we've got Greg on here who's been a big sort of part of your team. Um, are there any other, you know, notable team members that you want to kind of mention that you've put together to, to see this tech move forward? Um, well, or Greg, if you want to jump in there, feel free. Yeah, Greg, if you want to speak to Neil. Yeah, no, I, I brought up Neil a little earlier, but uh, Neil Branda, Dr. Neil Branda, you know, he's, again, a Canadian research chair of material science. Uh, so that's a very high standing inside the academic community inside of Canada. And uh, the thing that's really great about Neil, is, and he's uh, Neil's on our board of, board of directors. And the thing that's really good about Neil is he's an entrepreneur at heart. That's his mindset. And so he really likes the point of trying to commercialize technology and and he's actually gone through that with uh, switch materials so he has lots of good experience and also because he's in he's out of sfu he's fairly close to us is that we get access to him and uh, quite often so he's actually a very very active board member from a technical point of view Got it. and that's been really good um so that's that having ha that access has been really helping us guide our technology development but we've also reached out outside of that. And one of the things that we've done, we have technical experts we go to. There's actually a solid state PhD chemist in University of Toronto that we actively uh, send questions to and have dialogue with because you know, those are the types of, we found an expert in the type of chemistry that we need and the type of interactions that we need. Uh, we also have a very good relationship with the local universities. So we've done projects with all the big three uh, locally uh, to look at, you know, whether it's characterization of the material or whether it's uh, evaluating it during in situ operation. So, it, we, no, no, I'll, I'll let you finish. We uh, so I think that's all been really good because it, you know, that's my philosophy is is that you know you have your core that's running hard, but you got to reach out to to experts to help you, and so that allows us to really you know act as a bigger company than 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 we are. You said you're working with the, or you guys have been in, you know, sort of works with the three big universities and those are here in BC? Yes. Yeah. So that's University SFU, of Victoria, UBC, UBC SFU. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, we, I know, especially the UBC and SFU, I probably know, you know, at least 20, 25% of the staff, the, the professors in, in between the two schools and the chemistry departments. So and that's really good because, you know, like, again, these are people that have very specific skills, very specific understanding. And you just, you know, it's, we're always looking for the right problem to get help from and, and then go to the experts. No, that's uh, the, the kind of a great outlook to look at or, or, or a great way to look at, you know, a lot of things in your life. Paul, looks like you've surrounded yourself with a, with a great team to kind of uh, work on this project with yourself. Um, Talk to us about some of your recent milestones. I know you've mentioned a couple, Greg, when you when you spoke, but uh, do one of you kind of want to go ahead and update our um, viewers and listeners on um, some of the recent stuff? 
Yeah, I think so. So some of the really important things, again, is, you know, for us, you know, if I take a look at the milestones is one, being able to handle the high temperature, you know, that was a big one. Being able to handle that with water, that was the next big step. Being able then to add some of this dynamic Richling cycling in the aging and being able to test that was a big one. And, and then the, the latest one is, uh, one of the things that I've been wanting to do since I've got here, but we, we needed to advance and mature technology enough to warrant it, is actually go out externally and uh, test it uh, with an actual uh, kind of a sanctioned uh, aging cycle. Uh, so we actually went out to a company called SGS uh, yeah. Automotive. And this company was actually bought by SGS, they were, but they, before that, they, and still are, are, are 100 percent focused on catalytic converter aging so of the catalyst uh, so we went out to them we actually used uh, what they call a, a rat cycle a rapid aging test um, it's actually an aging cycle and it's we got it from the california air resource board it's well known in the industry um, and so we we did that test with this company uh, we actually it was a very cool setup that we worked with a sgs so we could do multiple samples at the same time so we could get more bang for our development buck. And uh, the thing was great. Uh, we, we went through the cycle and then we were able to test it during those light off and, and those uh, air to fuel sweep tests. And it kind of confirmed what we knew um, that, you know, we had this uh, dynamic problem where we're trying to go between rich and lean. Um, and we needed a, you know, it showed us we had a little bit of work to do on, on some of the high temperature or the high, uh, you know, to get a little extra high conversion rates at the, at the top end. But for most part, it was good because it, it, it kind of confirmed that, uh, you know, these are the, we're working on the right issues. Uh, it also allows us to have our own data. So if we, you know, when we've done testing or sent samples out for testing for an OEM before, you can't really share that data publicly. You know that's confidential data. So now we have our own data that we can we can actually you know should look at and share. Um, the other thing is it actually gave us a link to our own internal testing and aging methodologies. So now it's great because while there were some differences with that that external testing, we can now really focus on closing that gap. And then you know we really do have the ability to replicate what we, what we will be be happening when we go out uh, externally. Got it. Well, no, thank you very much for that breakdown. Um, Paul, I wanted to ask you, um, feel free and decline if you don't want to answer it, but do you guys have any competitors out there that are working on a similar tech? Well, I think, I mean, I think all the- uh, The big ones. The, the big guys, the, catalyst, the catalytic converter, the catalyst suppliers are. Um, fewer and fewer of the OEMs are. I mean, it's a very hard problem. Um, you know, in terms of independent, uh, we're not aware of too many uh, smaller companies that are doing work in this area. And it's, it's, it's become more complex over the years as the standards have tightened, you know, and, and I mean, it's, you know, from our perspective, though, I mean, it's also become more of an opportunity because as the tan standards have tightened, loadings of PGMs on these catalytic converters have increased, right? I mean, I think China just China just uh, went up a step and I think, uh, you know, I mean, that's, the, they've got to add, I think, 30% more palladium to their catalytic converters to meet those standards. So, so it's, I mean, from an economics perspective, it's becoming a more attractive target, but it is a difficult problem. And they're, you know, I mean, over the years, people doing this type of work have faded away. I don't think too many of them got as uh, far along as we have. But, that, that, uh, was, that was going to be my next one is, is, is it seems like, you know, you guys have been working on this for quite a while. You've obviously got the right people on your team to help move it forward. And, you know, from what you guys have told me, it seems like, you know, uh, the, the, the larger Fords and the OEMs are, are obviously interested in your tech and, and having those conversations with you guys to help move the, the, the technology forward. So that yeah, those they're, are they're all working on it. I mean, they're still working on it, but they're not as active on it as they used to be. Yeah. I mean, they do have base metal catalysts and we have actually come up against a, an OEM base metal catalyst. And, you know, I mean, I think we can say we outperformed it, <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, I mean, it's, it's, we're still looking at the, I guess the highest use of our catalyst, which is basically purely a base metal catalyst in an automo automobile. There is, I mean, a lot of the people that have been working on that type of, 
project before have uh, have been forced to move down uh, to thrifting, which is basically trying to save 20 or 25 percent, which is still significant to the OEMs. I mean, if you can save them 25 percent, they'll be interested in the technology. We're still looking at saving 90 percent. So we do. I mean, there are other avenues if we if we run into any roadblocks in this area. I mean, we can look at uh, doping or thrifting, but you know that's where most of the people in this space have tended to go. Got it, Paul. If um, any of the viewers would like to learn a bit more about you know your low cost catalytic converter technology, uh, as well as the company and your team, where would they be able to find more info? Um, I think our website has a has a deck that talks about it. Um, you know, I mean, it, and there's ample resources on the web. I mean, the catalytic converter into, into Google could return a lot of hits. Oh, I'm talking about specifically ether catalyst. About our company? Well, our, yeah, yeah. Our, you know, I mean, they can reach out to, to any of us. I mean, we answer the phone. Um, and, you know, I mean, our website's a good resource to start. The deck has a lot of information on the, the market size on, you know, and, and what we're trying to do. Absolutely. Um, so yeah. So if anybody listening is interested in learning more and reaching out to the company, feel free and find them either on LinkedIn or through their website. Uh, I'm sure Paul uh, would be more than happy to have uh, one of his team members or himself reach out to you guys. Um, Paul, you, you, both of you, Greg and Paul, you, you've both given us and myself a lot of education when it comes to the space, the technology. Why don't I... Um, leave the floor with you too. Like, uh, is there a message that you want to put out to, you know, shareholders or even uh, anybody listening on why they should be keeping an eye on what you, you and your teams are doing? Well, I think the biggest, I mean, the biggest reason to keep an eye on it is it's a, uh, it's a huge market. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I think uh, precious metal just not, you know, when we talk about the size of the market, we're, we, we always speak to just the precious metals, right? We don't talk about any of the other, you know, we're talking about spot metal prices, you know, and I think the, the demand for precious metal for auto catalyst last year was about at current prices was about $20 billion. And that's every year. Um, so it's a huge, massive market. And we have OEMs that want a cheaper solution. So it's, it's a big market. We have customers we're not going to have to educate, we're not going to have to sell to. Yeah purely a performance issue we can get there you know and when we get you know when we get there it's binary it's it's not we don't have to market the, the oems don't have to they don't have to get a margin on this part it's not a it's not like intermittent windshield wipers where they gotta you know tell you you need them and get a margin on it it's it's something they can slip into your car and you don't even know it's there and they put 200 bucks in their pocket and and all the cars need them the demand is definitely there so the um, demand's there and i mean you know everybody talks about electric cars i mean that's a, usually the first thing people say to us is electric cars but you know uh, i mean places, i was going to get to that <laughs> yeah i mean there are places i mean you know for example india india is a is a huge market it's problematic for electric vehicles in that their grid is uh their grid's very unreliable um yeah. It's not going to happen there anytime soon. Rural areas, you know, I mean, even the grids, even the infrastructure in cities, you know, if you if, if it was 25% electric cars tomorrow, would, would they be able to handle it? So, I mean, that's something that's happening. It's going to happen over the years. But, you know, I mean, we're, you know, the market for us, if it was cut in half, is still $10 billion. I mean, it's still massive. So, I mean, that's, that's the one thing we get. And, I mean, our answer is just, you know, I mean, if, we're, we're probably not going to be, by the time electric cars are more than 50% of the market, we're not probably not going to be working on this problem. So we're either there or we're not. I, I like how we came to this crossroad because that was going to be part of my, my conversation that I brought up. So I, I'm, I'm glad that you were the one to kind of point that out. And I hope people realize that, you know, electric cars are still a long ways away. And um, yeah, no, so it's great. Greg, do you want to maybe jump in with, any insights on why people should be looking out for what a company like Ether Tech Catalyst is doing? Yeah, I think the one thing I would I would point to and 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 re bring out is is again you know really in the last four and a half years we went from you know trying to get good conversion green you know beginning of life to we throw all the stressors in there so now we've been able to demonstrate that we can retain. Uh, our, our good performance through aging and realistic aging. Uh, we even went external to get it aged. So I think in that sense, you know, we take great pride in that 
we see a problem, we solve a problem. We see a problem, we solve a problem. And these problems, you know, when, when they're big problems, doesn't matter. So far, we've been able to solve the problems. And I think that's one thing I think that's been very good about the company is, is that the speed at which we're going through the problems so far has been really good. And the other thing, the other thing I might want to mention is, you know what, if you're a big investor in Palladian companies, we're a hedge because <laughs> we're doing our best to. <laughs> well played. Um, I, I really appreciated your time, gents. Um, you coming on here and talking to not just me, but our audience as well about what the company's up to. What's your ticker symbol? I'll let you say that. A ATHR. ATHR on the CSD. Uh, yes. If you are looking for more details on what this company is up to with their technology, feel free and visit our website. Um, again, gents, is there anything else that you'd like to leave it with before I, I wrap up? I think we've covered a lot of the bases for people to get interested enough to look at what you guys are doing. Obviously, I'm talking about the people that might not know about you guys. Um, definitely a game-changing tech. And um, I, I look forward to when we can host you gents again Hopefully once, uh, you know, you've, you've crossed that finish line soon enough. And uh, we'd love to have you guys on here and talk about the successes. That's great. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Not a problem. I, I do want to mention, uh, I want to thank the Canadian Securities Exchange for um, providing us with a platform like this, that we can talk to different uh, industry leaders, thought leaders, CEOs of companies in various sectors. Uh, and find out about, you know, some of the stuff everybody's working on, not only to change the environment in the world, but to keep things cost effective as well. Um, when it comes to your day to day life and driving around and, and just whatever. I mean, technology is a big part of our lives now. So I'm, I'm happy that we have this conversation, gents. Um, if anybody is interested, um, feel free to log on to our uh, YouTube channel at CSC TV or find us on uh, any of the social media channels, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. Um, again, if you do like our content, hit subscribe and feel free to share it with uh, any of your friends and family that might be interested. Gents, I, I again appreciate your time. Paul, I really like those paintings in the background. I wanted to say that earlier. <laughs> My wife. No, they 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 add a great touch. I love it. Um, I I think we've covered everything here, Jen. So I I look forward to hosting you guys again. Um, thank you very much. Be safe, healthy, and happy. All right, you and, as well. And best of best, best of success to you and your teams. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Okay.